I'm not convinced that there's a shared understanding of the role that schools are playing in shaping the future we're headed towards, and I'm not convinced that people understand the role that schools could play in creating the future we want. So here we go. In 1837, Hans Christian Andersen wrote a story called The Emperor's New Clothes. 125 years later, my grandmother read it to me in 1964, and I was struck by the last few lines, and I'm going to read them to you. But among the crowds, a little child suddenly gasped out, but he hasn't got anything on. And the people began to whisper, there's a little child saying he hasn't gotten anything on. Till everyone was saying, but he hasn't got anything on. The emperor shivered, for he suspected they were right. But he thought, this procession has got to go on. So he walked more proudly than ever as his noblemen held high the train that wasn't there at all. Then I got to middle school, 1968, and I was thinking, what was Hans Christian Andersen trying to tell us? I was in the first global education experiment in 1968 when people were realizing that we needed to understand the world around us and understand how to learn to learn and think about our thinking and understand rapid change and complexity. And we started tracking the state of the planet data when I was 11. I grew up to become a global educator because that's what I knew. And then in 1987, the word sustainability arrived on the radar screen. And I thought to myself, that's the name for the desired condition I want to educate for. I believe I've been tracking unsustainability my whole life. What the heck is sustainability and how would you educate for it? because it sure doesn't make sense to educate for an unsustainable future. Then in 1992, we had a big conference in Rio de Janeiro, the first global summit on sustainability. And they, we all, 174 countries uh, came to that conference. We all signed an agreement called Agenda 21. And in Agenda 21 is Chapter 36, the education chapter. How many of you have heard about it? Right, one person, yeah. That's about, that's about normal. Um, the strange thing is nobody in the US ever heard of any of that. Maybe it's not so strange. Um, but in chapter 36, that was the first time that we articulated the competencies. What would we need to know and be able to do and be like if we were actually going to turn the ship around and head towards a sustainable future? So uh, about 1995, I founded the center. I thought I was late. Turns out I was a bit early, about 20 years early, as it turns out. And one of the things, of course, the first thing you do if you want to do anything in education is spend a lot of time with teachers. And I'd already been spending a lot of time with teachers as a global educator here in New York. I used to be the director of New York and the world. It was a great title. I hated to give that up. Um, <laughs> So uh, we started creating a learning community because none of us had a clue what we were doing. So we started a learning community to see if we could figure out uh, how to teach about something we didn't know how to do. Uh, and one of the first things we did was to create a little simulation called the Fish Game. And it was an adaptation of the Fish Banks game that Dennis Meadows had created. I'm still thinking all this time about the emperor's new clothes that my grandmother had read to me because each year, that time goes by and people don't notice what's going on in the world, it's a little bit creepy, especially for the kids who can actually see what's going on in front of them. And so we started the fish game, and it's a little system dynamic simulation, and you play it, and there are different kinds of variables in different games. And the object of each game is to have as many fish as possible by the end of 10 rounds. And of course, most people think, for me, and they don't hear the 10 rounds. And so people crash the system again and again and again. And by crashing the system, I mean they overfish. They run out of fish. And the game is over quite quickly. Again and again and again. Hundreds of thousands of people now all over the world. Exactly the same results every time. Except for a couple of times, a couple of rare groups, one of whom was the Blue Man Group. Um, and you can imagine what kind of thinkers they are. Um, and that's what it takes. A little bit crazy, a little bit creative, super smart um, to, to recognize it. So before I go on, I think it's a good idea to, to, to tell you what I mean by sustainability. Clearly, there's no shared understanding of what that word means. 
I like this one by John Ehrenfeld, the possibility that human and other life will flourish on the planet forever. It's very poetic. You got to love that. And what I want you to focus on is that, that word possibility, the possibility that we last forever. It's a beautiful thought, but based on the evidence, I don't think everybody has a shared understanding that we're not guaranteed a spot on this planet. There are no guarantees. Even taxes, apparently, are not even guaranteed anymore. It's hard work to sustain a species on this planet. Very, very hard work. To be sustainable, to sustain anything, you have to create very, very favorable conditions, and they have to last. If humans want to be sustainable, we would have to create long-lasting, mutually beneficial relationships with all of the systems upon which we depend. Here's another one. A sustainable society is one that is far-seeing enough, flexible enough, and wise enough not to undermine our social and physical systems of support. You know, only 1% of the species that have ever lived on the planet are still here. Only 1%. The horseshoe crabs are having a good run. We could learn something from them. They've been here 60 million years. This is our chance. Listen to me. We have a chance to do this. It's really important. We all have a chance to be part of the 1%, finally. So this is good. This is good advice. In other words, you and I should not shoot ourselves, our children, our students, our grandchildren in the foot. Right? That's what she's saying. Good advice. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Why is she saying that? Are we shooting ourselves in the foot? And if we are, how come everybody can't see that? Don't you wonder about that? The ladder of inference is a great tool for unpacking that. And let me show you how it does that. Start at the bottom, concentrate on the ladder first. At the bottom is the actual observable data, actual reality. Uh, I know there's a lot of virtual people here, but this is the actual reality that, that we want you to concentrate on, as if a video recorder was capturing it. That's what's actually happening. We then enter the picture and select data from what we can observe. Where you stand depends on where you sit in the system. So you can only see a piece of that action. Then we add meanings to what we see based on all kinds of cultural and personal narratives. From those meanings, we make assumptions based on the meaning that we've added. From those assumptions, we draw conclusions. Then we adopt beliefs about the world. Then we take actions, and then those actions have results. Sometimes we like to say um, thinking drives behavior, and behavior causes results. So if you don't like the results, you go way upstream to think about your thinking. It'll save you a lot of time. And what happens is right there when we're adopting beliefs, it creates a feedback loop right back down to the next set of data that we can select. And that feedback loop then has a lot of names, as you can see on the right there. The box, you've heard of in the box thinking and out of the box thinking. Some people call it the comfort zone. I was thinking of putting a little chaise lounge in there. Schema, mental model, mental map, the brain scientists call it, frame. There's a lot of words for it. A lot of different fields of study talk about this. Lisa Feldman says, our prior experiences with the world inform what we can perceive. OK, so this is tricky business. Very tricky business. I've actually named a bunch of the mental models of unsustainability and those of sustainability so that we can begin to, I disagree that when you name something, it's the only thing that happens is that you can undermine it. When you name something, it, you, can, you actually have the schema for it and you can actually develop language for it. Having the word sustainability actually was very, very useful for us. All they really are, all that really is, is a guiding construct that's going to change over time with new knowledge and applied insight. And it's really easy for kids to not get stuck in, in the frame because the patterns haven't kicked in yet. It's only until about the age of 13 or 14. Once that hits after eighth grade, the, pattern, the repeats start happening. And it's a little bit harder to think outside of the box. Totally possible, though. Totally possible. Remember when Piaget talked about um, when, when you learn something that fits into your existing schema, you assimilate it. But if you see something or begin to learn something that doesn't fit into your schema, you literally need to rewire your brain so that you can accommodate that new information. 
most of the work of educating for sustainability is about accommodation or reframing, reappraising, as the brain scientists would call it. Why is it so easy to get stuck in our thinking? And again, kids don't have this problem. When they play the fish game, they may crash once. They never crash twice. Never. I've never seen it. If somebody's greedy, they take your right to fish away. Done. Adults will do, go to great lengths to accommodate greedy people. So it's the adults I'm talking to now, all the emperors in the room. My friend Peter Senge says, everything is internally consistent within the frame we're operating. So it's like our thinking is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Lisa Feldman says, everything that happens is reported to the brain as absolute fact. That's why it's so hard to distinguish facts from opinions. Ellen Langer says, behavior makes sense from the actor's perspective. So it's actually rational to think whatever way we think to ourselves, of course. Starting to see a pattern here. Different fields of study, psychology, system dynamics, all noticing the same thing. Here's what Stephen Jones says. I love this. Most people make sense to themselves. That's my favorite one. That explains the emperor's dilemma. I'm always working on that Emperor's New Clothes story. I've been trying to figure it out since I was five years old. And, and Stephen represents a field of cultural competency. So you see this is emerging in many, many places. So if it's so easy to get stuck in our thinking, why is it so hard to get out? Fear, fear of change. Change is a death threat from the brain's point of view. You know that, right? How many of you have studied the brain science? How many of you are, are working with? I'm always amazed at that, that the corporations are all over the brain science. And we're in the learning business. And, and, and I don't see many educators uh, paying attention to the brain science. I think it's going to be really useful. You're going to have fun. Um, so why is it so hard? Not only is change difficult because it's the unknown and that's where the threat is, but some mental models, if you will, are easier to shift than others. It depends on how much your status, your identity, and your money are tied to the old mental model. Very, very interesting. And if you don't believe me, ask Copernicus. He suffered greatly. You remember who Copernicus was, right? Yeah, well, we still have a flat Earth society. And there are still a lot of people that are having a difficult time recognizing that everything doesn't revolve around them. Mindlessness is not stupidity. I love this quote. Ellen Langer says, mindlessness is a state in which the brain is trapped in the past. So it's sort of like always operating with yesterday's news. That's what we have to struggle with all the time. That's our hardwiring. That's where we've been. But it's not our destiny, and it's certainly not our future. So how do you, what's the cure? What's the cure for mindlessness? Well, of course, mindfulness. Well, how do you get that in a classroom? How do you get that on a day-to-day -day basis? You have to learn. You have to learn how to learn. You have to think about your thinking. You have to reflect. You have to empathize. Engage in transformative learning experiences. Ask different questions. Rewires the brain. Storytelling rewires the brain. Changing perspective to increase understanding changes the brain. Creativity and engaging in the creative process literally rewires to keep us mindful and keep us present. Paying attention to the feedback, not to what we believe we see, but to actually what's going on keeps us mindful. What are the results of being stuck in our thinking? We literally ignore or can't read the feedback. This explains a lot. People who say to me, oh yeah, my kids learned, learned that, I taught it to them last week. God, if it only worked that way, wouldn't that be something? You just throw it out there, they pick it up, they learn it, done. What's the evidence? How do we know? It's very, very tricky, too. The, we uh, exceeded carrying capacity on this planet in the 1980s. Nothing happened. It wasn't even in the newspaper. Now I'm starting to figure out what the heck is going on. It also explains what goes on in the fish game. Two forms of feedback. We have scorecards and actual little fish right in front of people. They don't use the feedback to change their behavior. They operate from their intentions, not from the feedback. They operate from what they believe is the right thing to do, not from the feedback. 
I even had a grad student once tell me, I don't understand why good intentions it wasn't the right strategy. I said, did you have any fish left? <laughs> no. I said, well, that's your first, you know, that's your first clue. I said, good intentions are definitely better than bad intentions, but there's the feedback. And you're in the system, and everything we do and everything we don't do makes a difference in the context of interdependence. So something you did or didn't do contributed. She could not, she spent hours trying to connect those dots for herself. She could not take responsibility for an effect she didn't believe she made because she meant well. We call it believing is seeing. And here it is, Kevin Oxner, finally, after all these years, 175 years after Hans Christian Andersen wrote his story, we get the answer. What was he trying to tell us? If we can't hear or see feedback, we cannot make relevant decisions for our brains to filter. We can't perceive relevant data for our brains to filter because our frames are driving our behavior, not the actual data. <laughs> Here's another result of getting stuck in our thinking. Hail the emperor. Here's what insanity looks like. It's a little systems thinking joke we use. Of course, the irony of that little boat is that if you cut it in half, you don't get two boats. It's one boat, and we're all in it. We call it the integrity of the whole. So how's our little boat doing as a whole? We like to say in systems thinking, all systems are nested in other systems. Another way of saying that is we're all interdependent on one another and on the living systems upon which all life depends. And there's no such place as a way. Did you know that? Apparently, most people didn't get that memo in school because we keep throwing things there. Interesting. So of course, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is a model that we use to describe those nested systems I was just talking about, and the interdependence of the systems upon which we depend, the social, economic, and ecological systems upon which our lives depend. Now, we put the economy in the middle, not because it's the most important thing, but because it's the system most dependent on the other systems. That's a big paradigm shift right there. People used to think that the thing in the middle was the most important thing. Why? It's just a model. All right, so how are we doing? How's the economy doing? How's the gap between rich and poor? How's the middle class doing? How's the relationship between the GDP, the gross domestic product, and all the quality of life indicators, like the gross, uh, the, the, uh, gross national happiness indicator and the genuine progress indicator? As the GDP goes up, the quality of life goes down on every measure. What's up with that? All right, so that's not, that is what it is. There's the society. How are we doing socially? How are our kids doing? How is their health and their life expectancy? How are their graduation rates? How are languages and cultures doing these days around the world? And what do we lose when cultures fade away? All right, well, the economy is completely and utterly dependent on the social capital. And both the ec economic and social capital are absolutely and utterly dependent on the natural capital upon which all life depends. So how are we doing there? How are our oceans and marine life, fish stocks? How's the health of the soil and the air and the water? How's biocapacity doing? If we exceeded carrying capacity in the 80s, how are we doing now? Mm, taking out resources at a rate of 33% faster than the replenishment rate. That's the state of the planet now. Are we shooting ourselves in the foot? You decide. It's worth noting that this is not the work of ignorant people. This, in fact, is the work of extremely well-educated people with advanced degrees. So if it's not a lack of education, we would argue that it's the education itself. And it's not the teachers, and it's not the kids. In many cases, it's not even the administrator. It's the system. Things change. Will we? Can we? Why do we have to change? Why do we have to learn? Life is dynamic. It adapts and it evolves. Nothing so constant has changed. This is not news. My grandmother used to say that. Same grandma, by the way. People often misunderstand what we meant by survival of the fittest. It's not the biggest bully. There are science teachers in the room. It's what? The most adaptable. It's the most adaptable. 
Those are the species that thrive. Those horseshoe crabs are doing something right. Now, learning, it turns out, is quite a different experience than schooling. You might have noticed that. You spend a lot of time in those buildings. We're talking about creating learning organizations. What a concept. You know that schools weren't designed for learning. That explains a lot. The past is not a predictor of the future. Of course we need to learn from history so we can invent the future we want. We just don't want to get stuck there. We need to be forward thinkers. We need to make advanced decisions. We need to invent the future we want. And we're not headed towards there yet. And it all begins with a change in thinking. You remember when Albert Einstein said, the significant problems we face can't be solved with the same level of thinking we used to create them in the first place? Education for sustainability is our gift to Einstein. It is that different way of thinking that he was asking for. So what is our intention? What kind of future do we want? Now be creative. When you envision the future you want, you have to get out of the box. How many new schools look exactly like the old ones but in miniature? That's not going to work. We have to create a different way of operating. Be creative. Creativity is a key property of all living systems and contributes to nature's inherent ability to, uh, to sustain life. So what do we want to sustain? For whom? For how long? And what does education have to do with it? We have to learn how to live well in our places without undermining their ability to sustain us over time. Um, and how are we going to do that? Curriculum and teaching best practices in the classroom, organizational learning, green buildings and good food, farm to table, relationship to the community. You'll see our framework on, um, on our website. And very quickly, because I'm already over time, what's our impact? Is it working? Can we do this in the 21st century, given everything we're talking about? Here's the data. We ha we're having the impact. We just don't make the test scores the goal. We keep them in their place as indicators of success. Kids are there and they're engaged. They're eating better, they're getting healthier because they're making better choices. They're learning about the democratic process and they're getting excited about it. Teachers, you can't have a healthy school if you don't have happy teachers. We all know that. We're ha we have happy teachers. And both new and veteran teachers are getting the outcomes that they want. We improve whole school cultures, relationships to the community, teacher and administrator relationships. And we're improving air quality, water quality, decreasing energy, uh, decreasing water use, saving money. Keep 30 to 50% if you save money in your building to roll back into your programs. And if, you, if I'm getting you all excited about it, these are the questions you want to ask. What are we already doing? What's education for is the first question if not a healthy and sustainable future. What are we already doing? What might we want to change? What do we need to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? A healthy and sustainable future is possible, and it all begins with a change in thinking. Thank you.